as my talk says, I'm going to talk to you about how to replace a database with theme pipelines. That's a bit uh, of a provocative statement. And uh, we're going to focus on one very particular use case where uh, we can replace some of the functionality of a database with Apache Beam. So uh, I'm going to start with a bit of background to motivate um, the problem, uh, give you a bit of introduction to the company I work at, Expanse, tell you the story of a database that couldn't scale. It's a problem that a lot of you have probably encountered. Uh, and then dive into how we used Beam uh, to fix the problem. First, uh, a bit about myself. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Expanse. I've been there for about three years in, in San Francisco right now. Uh, one of my nicknames at the company is Dataflow Jesus. I've accumulated some Dataflow knowledge and like to spread it around. Um, a bit about the company, uh, just to motivate things. Um, if you haven't heard of Expanse, we have a global internet collection system, an attribution platform. Uh, we help people discover, evaluate, and mitigate their attack surface. What does that actually mean? We scan global IPv4 space on a variety of protocols, and we try to identify ownership of internet assets like IP space or domain names. And then we use that to help people identify and fix their attack surface. Brief overview of what our product looks like. We find things like open building control systems on the internet, publicly exposed databases that may have consumer information, and vulnerable entry points to corporate networks. So this is the kind of data that we are working with at Expanse. Uh, this is a very high level summary of what our data pipelines look like and where Beam fits in. Uh, we have a global internet collection system. We have asset discovery. We join those together. We enrich data with other pieces of data, classify that data, apply aggregations, Almost all of that logic at Expanse is implemented in Apache Beam. And we use that to power our APIs and customer-facing integrations. So more detail about how we use Beam at Expanse. We have over 50 Beam pipelines. So we are heavily invested in Beam. We're processing over 100 terabytes a day with Beam. Our first Beam pipeline was built in 2016, which is actually a lie because Apache Beam, Beam became an Apache project in 2017. We were using Google Dataflow when it was in alpha. Uh, we use the Java SDK, and we mostly use the direct runner and the Dataflow runner. So we are very much a Beam shop. All of our backend teams are using Beam. What does that look like? Well, we have this platform code base with lots of common transforms, tooling, monitoring. We build platform pipelines on top of that and applica application-specific pipelines on top of that. So pretty much everyone um, working on a backend team at Expanse. Uh, uses Beam. So that brings me to the problem uh, today, the story of a database that couldn't scale. This database was used to power a particularly problematic API, which we'll call the Observations API. This API was returning every single sighting of a service on the internet that was relevant to one of our users. It classified those sightings by whether it's an appearance of a service, maybe the first time we saw something on an IP, a new web server that someone put up, or something existing that we had seen before. We're processing 20 terabytes per day of new observations from our global IP scans. And of those, about 1% are relevant to users. This is a lot of data uh, to add to an API every day. In terms of what this looks like, mapping this back to the previous diagram, in the global internet collection tier, we have these data points, these observations of things on the internet. We filter that down, take a subset of them that are relevant to customers and enrich them with other data sources that we have. And we're surfacing each of those data points in our API, the observations API. This API, unlike some of our newer APIs, does not perform any sort of aggregations. It doesn't summarize data by IP. Um, it's just a one-to-one -one every time we see something. Some of the problems we saw with this API. So it was built uh, in our early days. And we provided dozens of filters on this API uh, with indices to support all of them. We did this in a relational database. This is a lot of load on a relational database to have so many indices and so much data. We had 40 terabytes in a single table. Um, as some of you may know, uh, a lot of relational databases limit you at less than that. And actually, um, we were coming up on a limit that 
Amazon RDS, Relational Database Service, was imposing of 32 terabytes. Magically, they increased it to 64 right before we hit that limit. We were able to keep using it for a little longer, but we knew that this was not scalable and would need to be replaced. It was costing a lot of money, uh, nearly 100000 a month in database costs for throughput, uh, mainly for IOPS, uh, but also for storage. And the rate of growth kept increasing exponentially. Um, every time we added more customers or started scanning more protocols on the internet or scanning more frequently, the rate of growth would increase. So this was a problem that was getting worse quickly. So that led us to really rethink uh, this API, say, what is it being used for? What are the requirements around this data? And based on that, design a new solution. So the data was not used by our applications front end. Um, people would periodically ingest this into third-party tools. Uh, people would occasionally want to ingest it into a new tool and pull all of their observations that we have from the beginning of time. They only really cared about three filters we found. Creation time of the observation, which organizational unit for that customer the observation was found in, and what type of observation it was. Was it an appearance of a new service or an observation of an existing service that we had seen before? So most of our filters were unnecessary. We also find that most people were just reading new data. Uh, so most data was read at most once so we can optimize for rights. And we had the key insight that our data is immutable. We are not changing it. So that gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of what types of storage technologies we can use. So we did an investigation into possible storage technologies. We picked all the you know, standard candidates, we said, let's move from a relational database to NoSQL. Maybe we could use a query, a query language like Athena or BigQuery. Uh, we looked at data warehouses, a few other things not mentioned here. Um, our main goal was to build something more scalable. Um, but most of these solutions are pretty expensive. Uh, NoSQL, even though it can scale up to, uh, to support this much data, it would grow to be very expensive as our rate of growth of this data continued to increase. Be a high ops burden to use a NoSQL database. Uh, Athena and BigQuery can be a bit slow to query, especially as the data grows. Um, so we, we wanted to investigate um, being, being Beam users, whether we could use an object store and get Beam to help us with some of the problems uh, that an object store doesn't support on, that uh, most databases do. If we can use an object store, this, this, our solution could be very scalable, extremely cheap, especially if we can compress the data, minimal ops burden. But there's some key problems. How do we guarantee exactly one's processing in an object store? It's just a flat file store. There's no there's no guarantees that uh, two pieces of data are going to conflict and nicely be deduplicated. How do we implement filtering? How do we implement pagination over large amounts of data? So we decided we could use Beam. So the rest of this talk, I'm going to go into kind of how we solved uh, this problem with Beam. I'm going to dive into some of the um, you know, key realizations we had about what Beam can do for us and some of the actual pipelines that we use to build a system. The first point um, was, how do we guarantee exactly one's processing? Well, this is something that Beam is really great at. Uh, with some runners, like Dataflow, we can guarantee exactly one's processing. Um, we can guarantee exactly one's outputs from syncs, as long as we're using built-in syncs or taking care with the ones that we build ourselves, and exactly one's output for each input for intermediate steps. So as long as we're not relying on side effects of transforms, and as long as our input data going into the system is exactly once data, we can make sure that data written to the object store is mostly exactly once. One of the harder problems here was filtering. Um, we, we actually thought about two different kinds of options for how to implement filtering on top of an object store. One option is uh, we could you know, write the data according to a path structure that matches the set of filters we need to support and scan that path structure every time to get the values that match a given filter. Um, this would require applying list operations at each level in the path to find available data. If there's a lot of data available at one level, possibly we have data for the last year for a company, we have to scan all those dates, maybe just to find a single one. Or we might perform a lot of unnecessary lookups if we just 
skip the list and assume that the data is there. So we found that anything that involved just scanning um, could be slow, could be expensive, a lot of unnecessary operations. Um, list operations can get throttled. Um, they're a little more expensive than just straight lookups. Uh, a nice alternative was uh, pre-computation. So if we can know ahead of time exactly what data is available at each level um, of the uh, path hierarchy in the object store, then we could very efficiently look up exactly the data we're looking for for a given set of filters. This means that data is not updated immediately when we write it. It means that we need some external process to do this. But the requirements on this data allowed us to do this. We thought, maybe we can use Beam for this. So I'm going to go into how exactly we use Beam to pre-compute this data um, and make lookups of large amounts of data very efficient, emulating some of the behavior that you'd normally get out of indices in a relational database. So the first, the first thing to know is the, the path structure. As I mentioned, in order to implement filters on the three filters people care about, business unit, date, creation date, and the observation type, uh, we want to structure our paths accordingly. Um, so uh, an object for a given business unit, date, and type would go to that appropriate location in the object store. We can then pre-compute information at each level about what's available below it. In particular, we can make what's called a date manifest that links to all of the available dates available for a given business unit. We can link to a types manifest to, to list all of the available types for a given date. And at the lowest level, next to the data files themselves, we can write out the list of available data files so that we don't have to perform that expensive list operation. We can know exactly what's going to be there. So at a high level, what does the architecture look like here? Well, in the middle, you can see this observations object store. So we're going to store the observations there. What else do we need? Well, we need some way to ingest the observations into that object store. We're going to use a streaming beam pipeline for that. We need some way to compute these, these manifests, these summaries of what, uh, what subdirectories and what files are available. Uh, so that's this generate manifest batch beam pipeline. And then we need some, some internal service to, to uh, implement the logic of how to use those manifests to retrieve the right data. That's this data retrieval service. Then we can power our APIs and integrations off of this internal API that provides access to this data. So I'm going to go walk through this system, note some of the interesting things about it, especially some of the interesting Beam code that we wanted to write for this. I'm going to start with the generate manifest step um, and then work my way through the other pieces that we built. So first, generating manifests. Um, I'm just going to go over each manifest in a bit more detail. At the top level, underneath the business unit, we have this date manifest. As I mentioned, this is really this is really just listing the available dates, the available subdirectories underneath the business unit. So in this case, if there's data for January 1st, February 1st, and February 2nd, or February 3rd, I think I have here, um, it's much more efficient for a service to look at this look at this file, and then be able to directly load those subdirectories instead of assuming that there might be data for every date between January 1st and February 1st, which would be a lot of failed lookups in S3 and cheaper, obviously, than doing a list operation to look this up at query time. The type manifests are similar. Um, we store in here information about um, the list of types that are available. So in this case, on January 1st for this business unit, there were both appearances of new observations and persistences of existing ones. Underneath that, we have the data file manifest. We actually store a little more information at this level. We can store not just the list of files that are available, but also the total number of objects in each file. By storing the number of objects in each file, we're going to make our lives easier when we try to implement pagination. This way, we can know exactly how many observations we're going to read if we open up this file so that we can read the right number to return um, a specified number of results to the consumer. We can also store more information about the file, like the total pre-compressed file size, and any other information that helps to 
make it easier to determine which files should be picked up and read. So how do we compute these files? Well, we use a beam pipeline. This diagram here is kind of the, the flow of, uh, of steps that we need to compute these files. And this looks a lot like a data processing pipeline. It is a beam pipeline. Um, how is it implemented? Well, we have a read step. That's basically text.io. We have some compute steps. Those are really just custom transforms that are going to uh, convert into the appropriate model. Some write steps, writing out file manifests. Again, that's text.io. Group by certain pieces of data. So by grouping by business unit, date, and type, we get all of the data for a given type manifest. So by composing these group by keys operations and built-in beam uh, sources and sinks, we're able to construct this relatively simple and inexpensive beam pipeline um, to compute these manifests, essentially replicating a lot of the functionality that you get out of a database, but uh, in a way that's pre-computed and maybe a bit slower. Cool. Uh, the next, the next uh, step is the data retrieval service. So now that we know how these manifest files are structured and generated, we need to figure out how are we going to read them? How are we going to use them to return data? So the data retrieval service is the service that is using the file manifests computed by the manifest generator to retrieve requested data. It implements pagination over the requested data. And it provides access to the data without knowing anything about the type of the data. All it knows is that these files have lines of JSON data. So we can compose this data retrieval service, as I mentioned earlier, with other APIs and integrations that enforce type safety, that provide extra logic around, say, authorization, permissioning. So this service can be a pretty minimal service, uh, which for us was a very nice separation of concerns. Because most of the consumers of this data are themselves HTTP APIs, we decided to use an HTTP JSON API for this service as the interface. So here we have a very simple single endpoint on the service, get data. Um, it accepts a list of uh, filters to the business units you want to get data for, the types, and a date range, optionally pagination, and returns the, result, the, re the requested data. So I want to walk through an example, um, walk through the actual algorithm. Um, how does it use the manifest to pick up the right data? Well, here's a sample request. Suppose we want data for business units X and Y, type A, from January 1st to January 3rd, and we want, want at most 10,000 results. First thing we're going to do is say, OK, we need 10,000 items. Let's read file manifests until we know that we are going to get to 10,000 items. It's going to iterate over the business units that are requested. So for each business unit you want, it's going to read all the date manifests under it. For each of those date manifests, it's going to say which of those dates are dates that you requested. So it's going to take the intersection of the requested dates and the available dates from the manifest. It's then going to iterate over the type manifests for each of those dates. For each of those type manifests, it's going to check if the type you requested is in the type manifest. It's going to take the intersection of the types you requested and the available ones from the manifest and find the relevant data file manifests. From those data file manifests, we're going to note down the total number of items in each data file. We're going to accumulate more data files until we get to 10,000 items. Then we're going to fetch all of the data in parallel. Now, there's one, there's one key, uh, key problem with this, which is that this first step here, accumulating the data file manifest, is a sequential operation. It requires a lot of repeated round trips to the object store. Uh, but the second operation, fetching the data, the bulk of the content, can be done in parallel. To implement pagination, we can then save a pointer to where you left off. That pointer includes the last date, the last type, the last data file that we read. As long as we maintain a logical ordering of dates, of types, and of data files, we can guarantee that we'll deterministically pick off from exactly where you left off. 
And we'll save that page token in S3 in the object store so that when you send your next request with the page token, we can figure out exactly where to pick up. So as I mentioned, one of the big problems here is that we need a lot of sequential round trips to the object store. This is especially bad if there are sparse files. So we might have to read hundreds of files to service a single request. Fortunately, the shape of our data means that we don't have a lot of cases where there are very sparse files. And when there are, there are a few improvements um, that can speed this up. One, we don't have to read all of those uh, manifest files in sequence. We can actually look ahead a bit. Um, instead of reading just the single data file manifest uh, for a given type, we could read all of them. Even though we might be reading too many, reading a few in parallel means fewer, fewer round trips to, to the object store. We can also implement caching. Um, so commonly requested manifests, we can cache. These are small, small files. So it's very cheap to cache just the, just the manifests in this data retrieval service. The last piece here is where a lot of the more interesting beam code comes into play, ingesting observations. So this is pretty much all of the code um, for the piece that ingests observations into the object store. It's a streaming beam pipeline. And um, it, this, this pipeline in particular is written in the Java SDK. I'm going to walk through it. Uh, that first step, reading file names and contents. Uh, this is our source of data. All that really matters here is that it's an exactly one source. Under the hood, we have a pretty cool pattern here for reading this data. We're going to store the file paths to the data in Kafka, and those file paths point to the actual file contents in another object store, in another bucket. That allows us to leverage Kafka to get all the guarantees it has about processing without storing a lot of data there. We can still get all of the, the benefits of cost from storing most of the data in an object store. So this data source here is our wrapper around reading data um, in, a, in a streaming pipeline that uses Kafka in an object store. The next important thing here after converting the string into the relevant model is, uh, is windowing. We can use a very simple windowing strategy for this pipeline. We don't have to do any aggregations of the data. So we can use the global window. Um, we apply a simple triggering strategy um, where we fire each pane um, after a configurable number of seconds. And I think we usually use uh, five minutes as that time here just to ensure timely delivery of data that we don't wait too long between writing files. This last piece is a custom wrapper around writing to an object store. Um, it basically wraps write dynamic. So using dynamic destinations based on the business unit, the date, and the type of the observation. There's one more thing that that piece does at the end. Um, we realized that this, this service was not very performant when we had a lot of very large files. And in fact, because the input data is very bursty and unevenly distributed, Textio would often write very large files and very small files if we just used its standard arguments or set a fixed number of shards on Textio. Compressed files, if, assuming we want to get the advantage of compressing these files, we're not going to be able to seek to a particular line, which means that these big files are going to be especially problematic for pagination when we have to pick up where we left off. The API service at query time would have to decompress a very large file in order to determine, uh, in order to fulfill another request. Having limited file sizes also allows us to better parallel, parallelize writes. So we wanted to find a way to manually control the sharding of the data so that it's dynamic so that it's based on the amount of data that goes to each dynamic destination. We figured out a way to do this with a stateful do fun. Um, so this is one of the cool applications of stateful do funds um, that we have at Expanse. And the basic algorithm here is that we start with the input object. We'll add its destination, the thing that's normally just going to go into dynamic, And that's based on its business unit, its date, and its type. We're going to use that stateful do fun to accumulate data for each destination and output data as a batch once that threshold is reached. 
This lets us limit the total number of objects per file. And we can also limit based on other thresholds, like the total pre-compressed file size, so that the data retrieval service doesn't have to pick up and decompress a very large file. So this is, this is a lot of code here, but this is, this is the, the core implementation of this logic um, with a stateful do fun. Um, I'm going to walk through it. The first piece, uh, this syntax here, state ID shard content state, that declares that this, this is going to be a state um, that is associated with a given key. Um, and this particular state is going to be the buffer of data for that given destination. The next pieces of state we have are those threshold, those counters that we use to, to uh, check against thresholds. The total pre-compressed file size and the count of objects. These are things that we can then use to determine if we want to flush a batch of data. So declare, we declare that state and then we apply our checks. We read from the state um, if it's initialized and check if with the new object, if we've reached any of our thresholds. If we have, we will flush the contents to a file and reset the counters. Finally, we will save the updates back to the state. Uh, so as you can see, this, this pretty simple stateful do fun allows us to dynamically control uh, the size of our, of our output files. Now, one of the methods we called there was flush. Um, how exactly does flushing a file work? Well, we don't want to manually re-implement how to write to an object store because we're going to run into problems with exactly when's processing and everything. Instead, we want to still leverage the code in file.io um, to be able to use that dynamic destinations code. Um, so what we do um, to flush a batch of data is we actually just append a random string to that data um, for everything in the batch. So right here, you can see um, we're generating a random UUID for that batch, and we're appending it to that destination. We're then outputting um, the destination with that appended random ID and the object. We'll then pass this, um, this transfer, the output of this transform to dynamic destinations. And file.io dynamic destinations is going to, when, set, when we set the number of shards to one, is going to output a single file for each of our manually curated shards. So this together is going to allow us to have um, consistent file sizes without re-implementing the wheel. You can see that the code there was very simple. Um, and it guarantees that the file sizes are sane. Stringing all this together, all of these components, um, we, we analyzed, you know, does this actually solve our problem? Um, and it turns out it does. Um, Latency um, with the new with this algorithm is only a few seconds to fetch 10,000 very large records. It's even better when the files are dense, when we don't have to deal with very sparse files. It was significantly faster than the relational database approach, which is not a surprise. The main benefit here um, is cost. Uh, all of these components together, a year later, after scaling up, um, to much more than our initial 40 terabytes of observations, our costs are still under 2,000 a month. This is way lower than our 100,000 a month previous cost. So this system is way cheaper. It's also extremely scalable. Um, by using an object store and beam pipelines, we, we think that this can scale up pretty much as much as we, as we would want it to, um, that we won't have to re-engineer it later. But the solution also has its limitations. Um, I don't think that uh, in all cases, people will be able to replace their database with Beam pipelines. But in certain very specific cases, if your data is immutable, if you're willing to severely restrict your access patterns to a couple filters and never change them, if you're able to unlock new data just once per day, and if you're going to accept that erroneous data might be difficult to clean up, um, which is a problem that we've definitely encountered a few times, um, then I would recommend that you replace your database with Beam Pipelines. Uh, that's it for the talk. So I think uh, it's time for uh, Q&A. Does anyone have any questions for Vinay?
We don't have any as of right now. Cool. Yeah. Feel free to uh, message me in the Slack channel. Uh, happy to discuss anything then. Awesome. And just a reminder to everyone that um, you can join the Slack channel at hashtag beam-summit-attendees. And remember to post all of your questions um, either here in the Crowdcast or on the Slack channel. All right. We have one question. Um, why didn't you use a compressed format such as ParCut? So we, we actually uh, explored a couple different compression formats. Um, we decided to go with gzip compression because it's what we use um, elsewhere in our stack. Um, but there's definitely possible improvements to the system. I think um, there are, it's possible other compression algorithms would be better for this case. Um, we were able to, to get um, a pretty significant, actually like a 30x reduction in storage from using the compression we ended up using. Cool. We can, we can wrap up and uh, feel free to ask me something in the Slack channel. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks to everyone. And thanks for Renee for that great talk.